Hey everyone, hopefully you're having a good day. My name's Andy, my channel's Finding Value. Today we're gonna to go through Twitter, see what people are sharing on social media. I'll interject my financial opinions as we go, generally related to three different topics, wealth building, commodities, and or financial topics. So uh, we're gonna dive right in here, take a look. Uh, if you wanna follow me, it's at Finding Your Score Finance. If you wanna join our community, finding-value.com, where I dive deeper into these sectors looking for potential investment opportunities uh, in the markets. Right now, those investment opportunities are mainly in precious metals uh, and commodities, precious metals being the one in full swing favor. So we've got, I can't pronounce his name, Gilherme, Gilherme, whatever it is. Another possible scenario which coincides with the blow off top in equities, squeezing all the early bears out of the market. And I think that's highly possible. Uh, we get a weakening uh, and a move lower off of the weakness in the markets, the lower interest rates, and that leads to a weaker dollar or do weaker dollar index here that we're showing. Uh, it is also possible that we come back to this support level uh, where there's a trend line coming across both areas. We gain support there, and that support would be gained because they're gonna lower rates and my guess is that the housing market is still out of balance. And we could potentially see housing starts go up. We continue to see strength in home builders. Uh, those, that's the market looking forward 12 to 18 months. Uh, and if we see that type of rating, I have a feeling that they're probably going to raise interest rates again. We would also probably see strength in oil prices. So if they, if we see strength in the housing market, uh, we see credit expansion from a monetary perspective, and we see the oil price strengthen as well. <clears throat> That's the credit coming into the system, putting oil uh, demand into the system. Then they would raise rates again. That very well could be the case or the potential path uh, of what could happen. Uh, George Gammon says the usual cycle, uh, the yield curve inverts. We get a bull steepener where the yield curve uninverts. Unemployment spikes, the Fed cuts rates, crap hits the fan, a recession. Says maybe this time it's different question mark. But that's the, the general, um, I'll say, order of events. We have a inverted yield curve. We did do some bull steepener, which means the yield curve uninverts, the shorter end of the curve drops. We do have unemployment spiking or going up, about to spike maybe. Uh, and then the Fed is considering to cut rates and then they usually are too late to the game and we get a slowdown. That's, this just repeats over and over. And then um, once that occurs, they generally do some sort of stimulus they cut rates, they might do quantitative easing, they load up the balance sheet with whatever. And then the curve inverts again uh, over time. Uh, and then this just repeats the step one and it goes over like this, over and over. <laughs> um, here's a, um, a saying, I guess. It said, I read a book that said, marriage is hard, divorce is hard. Choose your hard. Well, you could choose to do neither one of these options. That is an option for people. You don't have to marry and you don't have to divorce, but um, obesity is hard. Being fit is hard. Choose your hard. And there are a lot of people that aren't obese, but they are also not fit. I, I wouldn't want to be that person either, but I would rather be the fit person, even though it's hard. Being in debt is hard. Being financially disciplined is hard. Choose your heart. Um, I'm in the financially disciplined camp, and I am actually scared of going way into debt. Very scared of that. Starting a business is hard. Working a nine to five job is hard. Choose your heart. Um, yeah, those are both hard. Life will never be easy, but you can choose your heart. Choose wisely. I think for the most Part, uh, your life is a, an accumulation of the decisions that you make. And every single day, the decisions that you make lead to a potential outcome or something. Every, every decision you make of what you put in your mouth is a decision uh, of 
what you want in your body. And then that interacts with your body and your gut biome. And there you go. You've got an outcome, uh, whether that's good decisions or bad decisions, will determine a whole bunch of things in your life. Uh, here's Martin. Martin Pelletier says, Saudi learned something from 2014 attack on shale, now taking a completely different approach, this time holding back production, letting U.S. shale deplete the crap out of their reserves while keeping prices in a decent range. U.S. oil will peak, and when it does, Saudi and OPEC will be on the sidelines waiting. Good for Canada, as well given our massive long-life oil sands and companies like Suncor, Canadian Oil, and Cenovos that have incredible balance sheet. I would agree with that. And I do think Canada is probably a really good way to play all this. They've got long reserve lives, steady production, and eventually, I think oil is going, to do, is going to go to a much higher level, also going to drag interest rates up with it. It's going to cause a little bit of havoc in the markets, I think. Lynn Alden says, here's my TLDR for the night. Um, I'm long-term bullish on oil and more so its producers. But traders are now burnt out from the geopolitical headlines. It'll likely move more closer to actual near-term shortages, not imagined future shortages. Patience is required. And I think she's in the camp with all of us that think we're going to get a really tight oil market at prices in the $70, $80 range. Um, and then those shortages literally have to be felt by the market, and then they'll, pu they'll pull the price up. And Copy is saying the algos are so good now that they don't even wait for geopolitical escalation before hitting oil. They actually roast oil before the es escalation. Here's another one from Josh Young that's tied to oil. It says, it's more interesting seeing oil trade down on inventory declines to multi-year lows. There's that decline down here, all the way at the bottom, for inventory. And, and I know people are going to ask the question, why is inventory so low and how come the price is so low? Well, that's your opportunity. Your opportunity is to look at the markets differently than everyone else. Uh, looking at commercial inventory levels, oil is about 6 or $7 underpriced undervalued right now. And that's your opportunity. Now, another thing to think about is the market is forward looking. So maybe they're looking and seeing a recession that is out there. And maybe they say, well, that's fine if inventory is low, but we're going to see a slowdown potentially in demand. And that's maybe why we're priced the way we are. I'm just trying to give a little bit of flavor for maybe why the market is doing what it's doing. The chart DGEN says the downside risk of holding physical silver at current prices over the next years is basically non-existent in his opinion. The upside potential is literally 1,000 to 2,000%. That's what an asymmetrical investment opportunity of a lifetime is made of. So he thinks, and what he did is he put a trend line here. He put the upper trend line in contact in the point up here. And he thinks it's possible to go up to $350 an ounce and maybe even up to 1,000. And that's where he gets the big 1,000 to 2,000% opportunity with the uh, risk of holding physical metals very low. It's probably the least risky position to put on, less risk than bonds, less risk than currency even. Uh, he sees this as one of the best asymm asymmetric opportunities in the market. And I would have to agree with him. Now, I don't know if we're going to go to $350 or $1,000. I don't know the ultimate top, but the setup is there. And that's where you have to take note. And then you also want to take note of how much risk you're actually taking with it. So when you see this much upside with so little risk, the symmetry is absolutely lopsided in physical metals at this time. The copiosity letters. So the summary of the Fed mi uh, meeting minutes on 8-21-24. So that was yes, uh, two days ago. Majority of Fed members believe it is appropriate to lower rates at next meeting if the data remains constructive. Recent data has enhanced confidence over inflation. Several participants considered a 25 bips rate cut in July 
Majority of participants said unemployment risks are rising. Outlook for economic growth in the second half of 2024 was marked down. Easing too late could unduly weaken the economy. The first rate cut since 2020 is coming next month, is what he put at the bottom there. Uh, the Australian dollar versus the U.S. dollar looking bullish for the Australian dollar. You can see the downtrend line and the potential breakout here. We're squeezing right up on that resistance. Uh, so I do think that we're going to see a breakout here. Now, in a recession, you know what generally occurs? We get a dollar that may hold up okay. Uh, and then you usually see a move lower where the dollar outperforms the Australian the U.S. dollar outperforms Australian dollar. But to me, this looks more like 2001, 2002, where we could break to the upside and see weakness in the dollar, which is different than other setups. That's interesting. 2008, you can also see a, a, a run to safety of the dollar. So we'll see what this does, and I'll continue to monitor some of these currency uh, fluctuations against each other. Henrik Zaberg says, how on earth the liquidists, my name for this particular group, can look at and can look at this and conclude liquidity will save the economy? Well, did they actually check the chart? We were in 2007 liquidity-wise. Was 2008 a great year for risk on? Was 2008 a great year for the economy? At the same time, they reject the most massive yield inversion we've seen since 1929 while the consumer is struggling. In market capitalization to GDP is 200%. It was only 107% in 2007. So talking about this liquidity index and the move higher. And then if you look, we were in that same situation in 2007 with the yield curve inverted. And we still had a recession with the liquidity going up. So I don't think the liquidity guys will save it. And this is what we're seeing here for yield curve uh, and bond prices. So you can see when these gather up together that they're turning points that we could potentially have a recession. So that is a possibility that we get a recession even though liquidity is going up. And maybe look, this is global liquidity index. And maybe he, this is more specific to the United States where the United States has a slowdown. Maybe. So they usually drag everything down, US does. Uh, here's Nat Gas. Hope is for an inverted head and shoulder on that right shoulder here. I showed prior, so shoulder, head, and shoulder potentially. Uh, household debt to disposable income. What the heck is going on in Canada and Australia? Real estate debt bubble in the U.S. in 2007 looks almost cute at this chart. So here is Canada and Australia way up there, and the U.S. is kind of deleveraged compared to those countries. Uh, Seth Klarman wrote a brilliant piece on this topic, and let's go over it really, really quick. Uh, so this is from Ben Graham's entire country became security analysts, memorized Ben Graham's intelligent investor, and regularly attended Warren Buffett's annual shareholder meeting. Most people would, nevertheless, find themselves irresistibly drawn to hot initial public offerings, momentum strategies, and investment fads. Even if they somehow managed to be long-term value investors, the portion of their capital, people would still find it tempting to day trade and perform technical analysis of stock charts. People would, in short, still be attracted to short-term, get-rich-quick schemes. People would notice which of their friends and neighbors were becoming rich, and they would quickly find out how. When others did well, if only temporarily, People would find it irksome not to be participating and begin to copy whatever was working today. There is no, there is no solve for the hungry investor like the immediate positive reinforcement that comes from making money instantaneously. A country of security analysts would still overreact. They would shun stigmatized companies, those experiencing financial distress, or those experiencing accounting problems. They would still liquidate money-losing positions as they were making new lows. They would avoid less liquid securities since those are the last to participate in a rally and hard to get out of when things go wrong. In short, 
a country full of well-trained investors would make the same mis the same kind of mistakes that investors have been making forever and for the same immutable reason that they cannot help it. That is psychology of investing there, guys. And these people, even if they were trained or are trained, will continue to make those mistakes. Emerging markets, bear plot within a bear plot, could this be an increasing bear pennant? It could. It could. And we could get a pullback if a recession does come. And that could pull back all of the uh, areas of the market. Here's equity he says, despite the overall strength of the U.S. economy and markets, historical trends suggest that elevated U.S. household equity exposure tends to precede lower future equity returns. This is household allocations to stocks are near record levels. Great society in the upper 60s. You know what did really well in the late 60s, early 70s? Commodities did. You know what did really well in the beginning of 99? Commodities. That was the bottom of the commodity market here, we got bottom of the commodity market here, and bottom of the commodity market where we're at today. This is all the same. And then this is the top of the commodity market. This is the top of the commodity market here. And you want to buy stocks in 82, 83, and 84. That's it right there. That's who is providing liquidity right now. That's who you're betting with if you're going long stocks, and that's not where I'm going to be at. Lost my uh, position there. Coming on down, we've got investment wisdom. In the long run, it's not just how much money you make that will determine your future prosperity. It's how much of that money you put to work by saving it and investing it, says Peter Lynch. Uh, breaking, the share of people who believe they will become unemployed in the next four months jumped to 4.4%, the highest on record. This is a significant surge from the 2.8% uh, per share seen in March of 24. At the same time, the share of workers who reported searching for a job in the last four weeks increased 28%, the highest since the survey began in 2014. This was also up nine percentage points from 19.4% recorded in July of 23. This is further evidence of the labor market is weakening. Ray Dalio says, he who, who, he who lives by the crystal ball will eat shattered glass. <laughs> Here's the banking sector with chaos theory. Uh, we've got this nice move up and then the selling pressure. And he thinks maybe this is a Batman pattern is what I see. One, the middle hump, then the up one. And then maybe we go all the way back to the 2020 lows, potentially. Potentially. And that's when commodity bull markets are made. And he's calling for a big move lower uh, for this uh, Spider Select X, XLF financial sector. Uh, and that's where we're going to end it, guys. So that's what we've got for today. Give me a thumb up for the content. Subscribe to the channel. Uh, subscribe to the website if you're interested. And uh, we'll catch you guys later. This is Finding Value.